as Phil from Beauty and the Beast, and they're going to be going to our neighbors and asking for candy, on what we call Halloween. But before it was Halloween, it was All Hallows' Eve, the day before All Saints' Day, a day in which many saints were venerated in the various cathedrals and the various towns. And it was the night before this day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 questions that he wanted to discuss on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. That's the event that we call the birth of the Reformation. 500 years today. Think about that. 500 years ago today, he nailed that document that spurned a movement that I think was more influential than that shot that was heard around the world. Mm -hmm. But in order to understand the significance of that event, because that's what we want to teach you, you need to understand the world in which Martin Luther was placed. Many of you have taken Western Civ with me, and so you would already have a context, but many of you have not. And that being the case, we must remember that whenever the apostles passed away and the, the church then moved on into a world without the apostles, it was a world in which many people spoke Greek, the common language of the man, uh, a world in which there was persecution throughout the Roman Empire. Nevertheless, that faded away after a man named Constantine came to the throne and saw the relevance of Christianity and how he could use it to unify the empire as Christianity had made so many inroads into the life of the common man by the 4th century. So he made it legal and then Christianity boomed. But then, about 100 years later, with the fall of the Roman Empire, chaos ensued. Many of the tribes from Germania, the Vandals, the Visigoths, and the Ostrogoths had broken through and because of that, towns receded. Trade no longer took place. The feudal system arose where individuals were simply trying to survive, trying to be self-reliant and care for themselves. There were no secular rulers other than the knights and then the lords that they served, but that was even only also for their preservation. <coughs> And the only organization in the West that was able to unify all of civilization was the church. The church. And under the leadership of individuals like Gregory, they call Gregory the Great, he became not only a religious leader, but also a political leader. Able to negotiate with some of these Germanic leaders and save Rome, for instance, from annihilation. So the, the papacy... So the church grew in power, grew in influence. And through the Dark Ages into the High Middle Ages, we see a sacramental system start to develop within the church. A sacramental system that held every individual directly connected to the church. For in the sacramental system, there were certain sacraments. That is, there were these certain levels in which one would enter the church either through baptism or whether they would be confirmed or whether through, uh, through uh, extreme unction they might leave this world or through the mass, through the, the, what we would call the Lord's Supper. They wouldn't call it that necessarily. Uh, they would be able to receive grace. The church was the dispenser of grace and you would be able to receive that grace through the church via the sacraments, which held a sway on individuals within the empire. Not only did you have a sway and a power the church had over various individuals, but there was a, a great lack of understanding of biblical knowledge. For within the Middle Ages, much of the learning, much of the uh, much, much, much of that which was learned what only took place within the monasteries, and the monasteries were separated unto themselves. The language of the scriptures was not in the language of the common man. The Latin Vulgate was the common Bible that was used. Sermons were preached in Latin, but very few people spoke Latin. So Christianity became a religion of practice. You did, in order to earn security. You add that with the sacramental system, which was basically a works-based type of salvation, 
And then you move to a scholastic understanding that started to revive culture, revive civilization as universities started to pop up in the 12th and 13th, 13th century, but a scholastic system that revived an ancient heresy of Pelagianism, a belief that Augustine fought from a, a British monk who claimed that, well, you worked to earn favor with God. It had made inroads into the church and it revived in another system called scholasticism. And under scholasticism, you had certain individuals like G Gabriel Bile, who taught a Latin concept of facere quod in se est, which means do that which lies within. And the idea was that if you do that which lies within, if you take that first step toward God, then God, through the sacramental system, will give you the grace to continue to move forward. But you first got to do that which lies within. You got also add to that scenario the fact that the church was corrupt. The infighting that had occurred amid much of the popes. The buying and the selling of clerical offices through simony. The appointing of leaders simply because they were your relatives of nepotism. The immorality that surrounded the church as well. Many of the priests who were supposed to be abstinent as that was the church's policy had mistresses and therefore also illegitimate children. And it was under this environment that Martin Luther entered in 1483. There were individuals before Martin Luther that saw the condition of the church. And because of the Renaissance and the return to many of the original sources, even to, to the Greek language itself, there were precursors to Luther. <clears throat> individuals like John Wycliffe, who challenged the teaching of the sacramental system and transubstantiation, which was the idea that the bread and the wine actually turned to the body and the blood of the Lord something that was practiced every week. And he dared to say that the Scripture should be translated into the language of the common man, which he, he did, translated the Bible from the Latin to the English, which the church was actually petrified that this could take place for fear that heresies would pop up everywhere. <coughs> Influenced by Wycliffe was another man named Jean Hus. Jean Hus, who was also an academician, and the head of a bohemian school championed many of these doctrines as well, claiming that the language of the scripture should be in the language of the common man, and the church gave him an opportunity to communicate these positions in the Council of Constance, which the Pope, that is the Holy Roman Emperor, I should say, gave him safe travel if he would go to Constance. So he did, but there was deemed a heretic if only he would then retract his statement, which he never did, and therefore was burned at the stake. Mm. The emperor lied. In 1415, John Hus died for his beliefs. So there were precursors to this reformation, as we would call it. Corruption in the church, doctrinal corruption that pervaded the land, and there were calls for reform, but most of the reform that was called for was reform for the corruption, the immorality that was within the church. And as one modern historian so put it, by the 16th century there was not an intelligent man in Europe who did not know that a reformation was at hand. It was on this scene in 1483 on November the 10th that a baby was born to a peasant man and his wife. The baby's name was Martin. Martin Luther, who later we came to know as Martin Luther, hmm. saw that this young boy had much talent, his father did. And knowing that this young boy could be his ticket to a higher social class, sent him to the uh, chagrin of the rest of his children to school. Young Martin learned, earned a bachelorette in 1502 from the University of Erfurt. 
And in 1505, he graduated second in his class. He was studying to be a lawyer. But interestingly enough, it was at this time, whenever Luther was returning home from Erfurt, after the plague had decimated many within that town, and Luther lost one of his closest friends, was grieving over the loss of that friend, that he became captive to a thunderstorm. And a lightning bolt struck close to him, hitting a tree, and Luther cried out to St. Anne, who was the patron of distressed travelers, that if she would only spare his life, then he would give his life to the church. And so his life was spared. And in this day, giving your life to the church meant becoming a monk for Luther because it was in the monastery that many believe was the closest that one could get to reaching and receiving eternal security. So Luther entered the monastery. Luther was a monk of all monks. Luther would sleep on uh, concrete floors. Luther would uh, fast from food, from drink, something his body paid for later on within his life. And it was said of Luther, in fact, by himself, I was a good monk, and I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven, by his monkery it was I. <laughs> All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, and readings, and other works. He joined an Augustinian monastery and studied under a very influential man within his life, Johann Stapis, became a father figure for Luther. Of course, we know it's Augustine who taught that concept of grace, understanding of our salvation by grace. For it was Augustine that fought Pelagius in the Pelagian heresy. So I dare say that Luther was greatly convinced in his studies of, of Augustine and his theology during this particular time. Also, though, if we think about Luther and we think about his time in the monastery, we cannot pass this time without talking about confessions. With Luther's background, with the via moderna and the idea, quote, in say, es do that which lies within the concept of the sacramental system, Luther was plagued asking himself, did I do enough? Did I do that which lies within, which would be required of me to receive the grace? Also within this time period, under the sacramental system, was penance. Penance which communicated that if you sin, you have to go and you have to communicate that sin to a priest, and then the priest will tell you what you need to do so that you can work off that penance. Because under the sacramental system, whenever you were born and you were baptized, then original sin would be wiped away from the baptism. But then every other sin after that was culpable. You were culpable and you had guilt. And before you could enter heaven, you had to work off that guilt. And you did so in purgatory. Thousands of years <clears throat> awaited you in purgatory. Thousands upon thousands of years. So that's why you needed to go to a priest. Confess your sin so he could tell you what to do to work off those years in purgatory. Luther was always also plagued by this because he wondered whenever he went to the priest, did I confess enough? So he would go through all of his sins. He would quote the Ten Commandments thinking of every sin that he might have committed relating to the Ten Commandments. He would quote the seven deadly sins and then go back and then he would do it all over again just in case that he might have missed one before. It was not uncommon for Luther to spend five or six hours in confession during this period. And it got to be where the priests, when they saw Luther coming, would go in the other direction. Oh my God. <laughs> it was even stated to Luther, Man, God is not angry with you. You are angry with God. Don't you know God commands you to hope? Now let me add one more element to Luther's life to paint the picture. Before he moves as a doctor to the University of Wittenberg to be a professor of doctrine and theology. And that is the concepts of relics. 
We even today in ancient civilization, Western civilization, uh, spoke of the Crusades. Well, as Urban II granted uh, a release from purgatory for anybody who would fight within the Crusades, what developed from that was a concept of indulgences. Where one could purchase freedom from purgatory. Or also relics. Where if you were to go and you were to visit objects, whether from an apostle or from a saint, just simply by looking at it, venerating it, you could earn merit from the treasury of merit to be able to release, be released from purgatory. Now, old Frederick, the Prince of Wittenberg, he had a really, really good collection right there in Wittenberg. That's why he didn't allow um, uh, old Tetzels, we're going to talk about a little bit later on, to come and sell his indulgences there. But the best, the best of all the relics were in Rome. Oh, in fact, in Rome was the greatest storehouse of these relics. Here there was the single crypt of St. Callistus. Forty popes were buried and 76,000 martyrs. Rome had a piece of Moses' burning bush, if you can believe it, and 300 particles of holy innocence. Rome had the portrait of Christ on the napkin of St. Veronica. Rome had the chains of St. Paul, the scissors with which Emperor, Emperor Domitian clipped the hair of St. John. The walls of Rome near the Appian Gate showed the white spots left by the stones which turned to snowballs when hurled by the mob against St. Peter before his time was come. In Rome, there was a coin that was paid to Judas the traitor Iscariot. And that itself was worth 1,400 years out of purgatory. And then, of course, who could ever forget the scowl sanctum? These were the 28 stairs that were moved from Jerusalem outside the governor's quarters where Pilate was located all the way to Rome and it was said that if one crawled up on hands and knees repeating the prayer Pater Noster that a life would be moved from purgatory and in 1416 it was even stated that you could also attain indulgence for your own family that would be the purchasing of removal of these years in purgatory. Not only from the relics, but also the purchase. Luther visiting Rome was a little bit skeptical. He observed many of the relics. He saw much of the immorality that was taking place. The corruption. He crawled up, hands and knees, stating the paternoster. But Maybe we see a little bit of Luther's pessimism when he gets to the top and he cries out, Who knows if it is so? That's where we now turn and we visit Luther in the small town of Wittenberg where he has been moved to be a teacher. Here we have the Holy Roman Empire. Germany was not necessarily the Germany we know it within this day. The Holy Roman Empire, which of course, as Voltaire stated, was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, but nevertheless, um, here is Berlin to give you a context. Just a little bit south of that is Wittenberg. Right over here was where Luther was born in Nice Leben. And you'll see a couple of other areas. Leipzig down here and Worms are over here. We'll return to them. But Luther became a doctor of theology and philosophy here at Wittenberg. And one of his duties at Wittenberg was to teach and to exegete before his students the Bible. And some of the early books that he taught were the Psalms and Romans and Galatians. And we know that it was from the years 1513 to 1519, somewhere during that time, Luther developed that very influential doctrine that had become lost. Not something that was new to the church, just something that had become lost. That doctrine of justification by faith. As he studied the scripture, <clears throat> the word of God, as he did so, like a pebble thrown into a pond that ripples out, so also he was impacted by these scriptures. And by 1519, we see a very clear statement of his conversion. 
Luther, in his own words, says, Meanwhile, I had already during that year returned to interpret the Psalter anew. I had confidence in the fact that I was more skillful after I had lectured in the University of St. Paul's Epistles to the Romans, to the Galatians, and to one of the Hebrews. I had indeed been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul and the Epistle of Romans. But up till then, it was not the cold, uh, it was not the cold blood about the heart, but a single word in chapter 1. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed that had stood in my way. For I hated that word righteousness of God, which according to the use and custom of all the teachers I had been taught to understand philosophically regarding the formal or, or active righteousness, as they call it, with which God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God. With an extremely disturbed conscience, I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteousness God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring, murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners, eternally lost through original sin, are crushed by every type of calamity, by the law of a decalogue, without having God add pain to pain by the gospel, and also by a fierce and troubled conscience. Nevertheless, I beat importunately upon Paul at that place, most ardently desiring to know what St. Paul wanted. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed, as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely, by faith. And that is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel. Namely, the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith. As it's written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. There a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. Thereupon... I ran through the scripture from memory. I also found in other terms an analogy as the work of God. That is what God does in us. The power of God with which He makes us wise. The strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. And I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the hatred with which I had before hated the word righteousness of God. Thus that place in Paul was for me truly the gate of paradise. Mm -hmm. Later I read Augustine's The Spirit and the Letter, where contrary to hope, I found that he too interpreted God's righteousness in a similar way as the righteousness with which God clothes us when He justifies us. Although this was heretofore said imperfectly, and he did not explain all things concerning imputation clearly, it nevertheless was pleased.